and uh, hopefully it works out. So um, Mindy's going to talk today, but I wanted to take five, ten minutes, whatever we need to just get started before, because we put a lot of stuff at you in the middle of a term that's busy and we're all tired, so there's a pretty good chance that something went right past you, and maybe we should just make sure that before we see a bunch of stuff, it's starting to settle a little bit, okay? So when you create a type, one of the things that we've seen before is that there are several ways to think about it. We sort of condensed it down to a few simple rules. They're slightly different in language than what is in the Martin Loft notes, but we start with formation, and that's giving you all the ways that you're going to notate the various types, like what ingredients are needed, what it depends on, so forth. Now, with dependent types, the formation rule is allowed to have actual physical data. A lot of the formations that we did in the semesters previously depended on some previous type. So, for example, we might do A cross B as a new type. And that would depend on having had A and B originally as types. So we would write something like A and B are types. And then we're forming the type A cross B of type. Or if we we're writing software, we might call it something like pair bracket AB. And various syntaxes for the same question. Now, with dependent types, we allow extra information. We can have not only, say, types. I might have A as a type. And I might have, say, an integer, which is no longer a type in the sense that this is a term of some type. Okay, Maybe not an integer for this example, say, a natural number. And I might make a list containing elements of type A and having length n. And this is not a piece of data. Sorry, this, this is a type. I guess it's a piece of data of type type, but the point is it's, it's a brand new type, and you depend it because you're depending on terms. So when people say dependent types, you could sort of think of this as depending on A and B, but the phrase dependent is almost usually, it's, it's restricted to the case where it depends on other values. And then on a technical level, we saw that you can't really write that down without a new class of functions that goes beyond simply type lambda calculus. You are, you, sorry, not simply type, that's not what I meant to say. But yeah, that's correct. If you just use combinators, the IKS, identity, constants, and this weird composition law, that only lets you have functions that don't depend on data. So we needed to create a brand new type, and the builders for that are meant to look like things you've seen in set theory or category theory classes in your life. So you might say, the terms it's gonna depend on, in this case, we depended on a natural number, Right? And then we got some new thing, which turned out to be a type. And this also depended on type A, so we could have even put that into our list here. And so tuples have always been ways to index functions in such a way that when you pick the position of the tuple, that's when you know what type it has. It's in the subset A sub n, or whatever. So whether you think of it from the set perspective in your mind as the model, or you think of it purely the type theoretically, the ideas are the same. Tuples are the way to open the door to this kind of construction. And you can see its value in writing all kinds of things. But in particular, it's going to let us write a very hyper strong version of logic that has things like for all. So last week, we saw Sean describe this as for all. So you say this is for all types A. And you say for all N and N. That's the logical interpretation of having a tuple of product type. And then there was another type. Did you cover it last week? I don't remember if you covered this, the sum type. Oh, uh, yeah, I hit on it. OK, so if you go to set theory, you would call this a disjoint union. Disjoint union types are trying to be sort of like an or. So if I depended on this disjoint union an, then to have an element of this means that there is some n that it's in. Because it's a disjoint union, so it's in one of these boxes. So that's equivalent to suggesting to somebody that there exists an n, and then whatever else you need. Okay? So this is the way of capturing the logic of for all that exists using these dependent types. But dependent types can be used for all kinds of things. In particular, we're going to try to uh, study today the equal sign. What on earth does that do, and how do we make it as a data type so that you can pass along information? Like the classic problem you have is that it's easy-ish to some degree, to create a piece of software and have inside there a command that says, you know, is equal. 
right? Like that tests whether two things are equal. But it just comes back as a true or false. And so you could have programmed your equals command like this. You could say def equals, there's different languages that use different things, but suppose that I'm going to compare x and y, and then just return true. Like maybe that's correct, but like you, the program has to trust that you programmed this because there's nothing built into the system that can verify that this is an equality test. So that turns out to be just a limitation of your imagination as a programmer, not so much a limitation of programming. If you have dependent types, you can actually use one loss ideas to make an equal sign that's checkable, that you can really make part of your whole theory. And it changes not only the way you program, but how you think of the concept of equals anyway, which leads us into what we'll try to do next term, which is leading to path uh, induction, which is a much more clever and nuanced version of equality, which is how we often think, right? I say all vector spaces of dimension two are the same. Well, they're not really the same. What do I really mean? Is that there's a path between one to the other that's basically interchangeable and they don't care about the differences. I might say something like A tensor B is the same as B tensor A. And I don't mean they're the same. There's some kind of natural isomorphism. And when you try to write those things down and get them right, you end up meeting something sophisticated. Okay, so that's where we're headed, and hopefully that gives you a chance to sort of remind anything. Are there anything else I could say that would cover details that you you just want to refresh on? Okay, so without any more pausing, let's go ahead and get Medi set up. Propositional equality. And before I get started, I want to kind of motivate what we're going to be talking about. So just to get into the pre-theory. So, so we have multiple types of equality that we've already introduced, right? So we have this notion of definitional equality, right? This is the idea of sameness of meaning. Sameness of meaning. Of meaning. Or Could you give us an example? Yeah. So um, let's say you want to identify two symbols, maybe. Is kind of how I was thinking of it, but like uh, you might say uh, two. Let's say the successor function is um, successor of one. Does everybody see what happened there? So, I mean, we'd have to know what successor of one is, but he's defining in a sense the number two. Number two has no meaning until he said it's it's whatever successor of one is. If you say x equals five. You're saying, I'm now going to equate those two as equal, not because there's some concept that made them equal, but because I defined them. So that's definitional. Right. I found a note on page 16. They had this yeah. example of like, you have A true, B true, meaning A and B true, so like the letters A on the top and bottom row mean the same thing. Yeah. Does I mean, that make is, sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So this is purely a stipulation on symbols in some sense. Uh, and then we have other types of equality. So we have, let's say, equality of types, right? Or equality of objects of types. These are like judgments, okay? So these might result, maybe you assume something, you say, something's true, therefore A is B, or A equals B equals A, or A equals B in A. But we can't really, we can't work with these in a way um, where we can negate them or add quantifiers, right? It's not really a well defined. We can't do that in a well-defined way. So here we want to introduce a new class, or a new type, called an identity type. Let's say A, A, B, which lets us talk about, well, suppose A equals B, then what? Or, you know, it's propositional. So uh, a few, few other things to point out about this. So, um, so these describe the quality of objects, quality of objects. And um, our problem here is that we want a computer to actually prove the equality of two things. Right? So for example, let's say that we have our two expressions, this is given in Martin Law, the example of 2 plus 2 equals 2 squared. How do we actually confirm? Right? We want our computer to prove this, prove that these two things are the same. And we have canonical things, and then we have these non-canonical things. So the process might go something like this. We reduce 2 plus 2 to 4, and we reduce 2 squared to 4. Oops. Reduce, and then you check. Uh, why is 4 equal to 4? Well, we should have a canonical reason. 
um, something that. Would you mind writing it that way? The way you said it sounded better than this picture. So like putting four on both sides, and yeah. then making a judgment that three. I like. It. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna do a circular thing, but I can. Oh well, okay. But just having two fours would be useful because right now it seems like you already made them equal. Yeah, no, it's a good point. All right. Four. Four. Now intuitively, we know that there ought to be an obvious reason. Anything should be equal to itself, right? So there's this reflexive property that we're all familiar with when you're just doing regular arithmetic that identifies everything with itself. Let's call this R of four, okay? So, so the basic idea is you're given two symbols, whatever they are. You want your computer to show that they're equal. You need them. You want to reduce each of them to a canonical thing, right? These are canonical, right? This could be, let's say, you have a successor function again. This could be defined by definition as a successor of three, three, and then we always have one reason. In this case, in the case of sort of elementary arithmetic, it's the fact that <laughs> equality is um, reflexive <laughs> to check that four equals four. And the computer checks it, says, okay, this is. True, so these two expressions are the same. Ah. Um, the very quick thing, so the quality being reflexive, even as a definition, so it feels something might it'll be kind of missing. It's like, I'm not yeah. sure you're going to get and This is just motivational. Okay, okay motivational. so this is soon, soon enough, this is just going to be formal. We're going to just say there's a thing called R that we can check to say that this expression is equal to itself. But, um, so yeah. So so moving on to give another example, or to give a more detailed example of how this might work, you might let's say we have the integers of the type. We have a successor function. This themselves, and again, let's say that we define addition of integers and this n as a. Maybe I'm going to interrupt just briefly, just because you've made a point of talking about the canonical thing here. Oh, yes. So if this is going to be canonical, then that really can't be called the successor function. That would not be a function. It would be the introduction rule. Oh, yes, you're right. And so, I mean, you're thinking of it that once you have an introduction, you can wrap it with a function, but that function won't be canonical. So you really should think of S as the introduction rule here. Correct. Yeah. That's a very, very technical thing, but it might matter with where you're going. Let's say a successor. So if you like the bar, say n colon n yeah. bar s of n. That's a good idea. And then if you want to make a function called suck that applies that, then that's a function from n to n. Good. Okay. And then now we can define an addition of two integers. Say n to n is equal to m, so n equals zero. And is equal to six, the successor of n plus k for um, n equals s. Oh, sorry, this should be an n. Okay, so let's say we have this way of defining addition. Uh, so then we, we would, and we want to prove. So let's say we want to show. We need to show that two plus two equals four. Okay, so we've reduced two plus two. Two plus two. Two, the successor of two plus one, right? Just by definition. So k is going to be one because two is the successor of one. And then we would reduce this to the successor of three. By definition, you'd be taking the successor of oops, three, which canonically is equal to. Um, or an object. Okay. Just a quick interruption. Why don't you stand to the side and let people see it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> just board skills. Um, and then, uh, it, does everybody see what he's done? It's a little bit sort of boring. I, we all know what four is, but there's something methodical about what he's doing, right? Do you see what he's done? The mentors. So then we need we need to check. So what does this statement reduce to in the formal notation that I'm going to introduce? So, but, but before you move on, like why is four the thing he gets to stop at? The whole point is if you're going to do this equality, you reduce until you can't go any further, right? That's the key thing here. It's the bottoming out kind of idea. So he's bottomed out because now this is a canonical. 
canonical thing. Okay. So if you, if you don't see that, then pause to think about that part. Right. And then fundamentally, in the language that we're about to introduce, the reason why this thing works is because we've established that we have a class. Here. You can use the other board. Uh, I was going to write my oh, okay, fine. proposition on the other board. Uh, just to uh, one step, just to make sure I'm understanding. So, canonical is it like equivalent, like axioms that we're stating? So, or it's so types can have right canonical elements. Actually, let's let's stick with the natural numbers. So there are two ways to introduce a natural number. Two constructors to that data type. One constructor doesn't need any input. It just says thou shalt have zero as a natural number. It's just one of the cases. The other one happens to depend on a parameter n. It doesn't have to, right? You could have Boolean, zero and one, or true and false. Don't depend on anything. Two constructors could exist like that. In this case, there are two constructors. One he didn't write, but there he's written it over there. Just put a bar above it so we know it depends on nothing. Oh, yes. And then the other one is still from uh, that was, set of words. Or that too. Yeah. What's falsity? I've always yeah, yeah, that's right. It's usually thought of as the empty type in type theory, but yeah. falsity is the logician. Right. And then in, the, in our categorical analog, something being false would be interpreted as a morphism of two. So in code, you would have one command called case class yeah. zero, extend that. And then you would have another one which says case class successor, takes an n, extends math. Those would be the two canonical things because anything that's built comes from one of those two okay. constructors. So at the end, two plus two is just looking things up. It's got some table of index that says, okay, I have a table that says look up two. Two says, oh, two was definitionally a successor of one, and then a plus means I need to turn it into a successor of. So technically, you stopped at successor of two plus one because that is already. But he's done the nicety of rewriting it for us into a canonical name. But successor of two plus one is already canonical because it's one of the two constructors. That's why I said it couldn't be a function successor because constructors aren't functions. They don't return anything. Right? So what I was about to introduce, we have this reason, so to speak, that four is equal to itself. But we're working in a type theoretic framework, so we need to have a, a type of thing that that reason is. Right? So formally, we might say that this is true because there exists something, right? let's call this R of four, of type, and what I'm about to introduce, of an identity type, a type identifying for with itself, the board of four. OK, I, I, I'm sorry. The board work is going to get crazy if you're going to want us to read that. Can you either change color or, yeah, or write it somewhere yeah. more, erase something above it? <laughs> My apologies. I'm not as good at this as Luke is. <laughs> no, all of us need practice. No, nobody is born using the board properly. So, okay. so what have you written there, and why why would I read that? Like, what what's the context of this statement that you just made? Context of the statement is that I have I have a reason identifying for with itself, and that reason is I guess you could think of it as the reflexive property of equality, whatever. But that is what we're checking the existence of. So what we've shown is that this thing exists, and in some sense, uh, this actually might be wrong. So correct me if this is like catastrophically incorrect. But my understanding was. In some sense, we can think of this as the same as the reason why, as the reflexive property of p plus 2 after we've already reduced i and p plus 2 to plus 2 plus 2. Yeah, that is actually correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well done. OK, so now to get to the formal side of things, we have the usual axioms that I want to introduce. So we're going to start with formation. The obvious. Okay, so type A. We have a thing with terms in A. We want to be able to talk about the uh, proposition of, or we want to talk about the type of quote unquote reasons or proofs why A could be equal to B. Now, A doesn't have to be equal to B, right? So, so let's just let's write it out. So we have another type, side A, A, B, which is a type type. That's just a well-defined thing. 
A may not be equal to B, but we can still write I to A and B. Right? Now we have introduction. This is going to be that identity rule that we were talking about with the reflexive thing. So we have type anything in A, little a. Then there ought to be a reason why A is equal to itself. We'll call this R and A. Okay. I think these two are pretty easy. The next two are more sophisticated, and I don't, I'm not even sure I fully understand fully understand them, but I can lay out the definition here. The next one is elimination. And before I talk, before I give you the formal definition. The motivation for this is the Leibniz law. So if you remember Leibniz law, let's say we want to assert we want to assert that A and A tilde are equal. We might define that the equality of these two things are being equivalent to every function, which is defined on wherever A and A tilde live, gives equal outputs when evaluated at A and A tilde. That's the motiva mo motivating sort of free up concept. Uh, I'll actually back you up a little bit because this is going to be circular if you use equals on both sides of that. Oh. All right, because now, uh, now I have to know what equals means in order to make equals. Right. So the usual statement is to put an if and only if. So you say for all f or propositions, usually you say for all p, p of a if and only if p of a tilde. That's fine. And so the premise is to say, Two things are indistinguishable if no property can tell them apart. Right, that's said in the negative, but if you say that in the contrapositive, you're saying two things are equal if for every property P of A is true, if and only if P of A tilde is true. And that's one definition of equality. Other people view it simply as a quality of equality, whether it's the definition or not. So some people think there's some notion of equality that pre-exists and then this is a feature. And other people say, I have no idea what equality means. I will make this my definition. But no one seems to dispute that it's a useful concept to think of. Being able to replace A for A tilde without causing any damage is what we mean by equality. But of course, I mean, one of the things that was sort of emphasized when I met with James on this topic is that we don't necessarily know what P is going to be coming down oh, yeah. pipe. So the computer can't necessarily predict that. But, which is why we're kind of introducing this as an axiom of what it means for two things to be the same. I think the if and only if that I was reading is really between the P of A and P of A oh, tilde there. Yeah, because yeah. I was like. So maybe just re just erase that part and rewrite it so we can read it. Ah, read it. Just make enough so people can who, who happen to be taking notes can see what we meant. Right. So this is the same as for all P. If and only if. And this avoids that circular nature of having equals on two sides of the definition of equals, right? So this is a place where people entail themselves with doing equality is based on equality. You can't do that. Okay. So now to translate this into the language that we're using over here, our elimination rule is going to become, suppose I have a reason to identify A and A tilde. Right? We'll call that reason X. And Suppose that I have some property, we'll say P. Um, can, I, can I write property this way? Maybe. Is that reasonable? Uh, that's a function. Yeah. Now, a proposition as a type would mean that it's a function from A into type. So B would not just be any B, but it would actually be the universe B. Oh, I see. So the type would be the right way. But let's do it with B and be happy with that. Okay. But when we get to homotopy theories, we'll see that there's this extra thing that it's not just going from A to B, it's going to A to type. So this gives you some kind of a fiber bundle of stuff. And we'll, we'll see that that has a geometric interpretation that really matters. But today, let's just get on the board with saying that functions are well defined is the goal here. Equal input to a function should give equal outputs. That's what we're going to try to make happen today. Okay. So the elimination rule then says, well, not only do we, so we're, there needs to be a canonical reason, S, which is going to defend, the depend on X and P as to why 
P of A and P of A tilde are equal. So P or we're using B. P of A. P of A tilde. Okay. Set to elimination rule. And then the final rule, the computation rule, is more subtle. Because uh, it turns out these these canonical things are not, I mean. But why don't we pause actually? I, I suspect that all of us could use a chance to go through this and see if we understood. The first part here is just notation, right? We could have called ID anything we want. When Mehdi and I talked, we just called it zoo, I think, or something like that, right? right? So it's just a name. ID, you know, the concept of equality is what we're headed for, but but we could have just created a new thing called zoo that yeah. takes A and A B. And then we make one single constructor. That one single constructor that he called R of A. It could be make my A, whatever. You make whatever function you want to call the constructor, and it makes an example, an instance of this new data type. But it sort of only makes one kind. It only seems to extend of type A, comma A, comma A, which is sort of a weird thing. It feels like, well, we have all this extra power. We could use A's and B's, and you only gave me a constructor that was A, A, and A. We'll come to see why. Nothing's illegal about that. We just don't know what else can be constructed. This is what we can construct. Then we go to the elimination rule. We see that we do use the full power of little a and little b, because the p of a and p of a tilde, those can be different. So you see that there's this asymmetry of the introduction and elimination. And it's really important that you notice this asymmetry. But you're just creating a data type here. You don't have to know what this has to do with equality yet. It's only in the elimination that you see why this actually handles equality. But is it clear the asymmetry? That's a key piece to, to follow through. So now, before Mitty does it, let's all see if as a group we, we've learned something here. What would you do if you had to invent this elimination rule yourself? Or sorry, the computation rule yourself. How would you get started? I'll just give a hint and say we have two canonical things. And we don't want them to just be completely independent and avoid. They need to work well together somehow. What's the recipe for guessing the structure of your computation rule? Put all the information from the discussion the elimination. Right. So the elimination rule always has one instance, at least one instance, of the thing you created. And so then you take every one of the constructors, every one of the introduction rules, and you compose it. So we're going to have an elimination rule, which on the top of the line, the premise is going to have an A of type and a little a of type A. That's the data coming in. And then it's also going to have the leftovers of the elimination rule, which is a P from AB. And then you got to stare at what is not yet defined and make a decision. So let's see let's, what maybe. Let's write out the top of it. Okay, so computation. Right. So to start in front of, I'm not going to write A as a type type. Yeah, that's fine. You can make that explicit. We have a little a of type A, new property. Okay. So that's our premise. Now, if we recall, we have a reason to identify P of A with, um, with itself, right? And how do we identify things with themselves? We do it through this canonical reason, quote unquote. Right, so over here we should have something, something identifying. Okay. So, right. so that's the only way we could have gotten something of type ID anything is with the one constructor. So it has to be an R of P of A or R of P of A tilde, whichever one you pick. But given that that's the only way we could have gotten there, what type does that have? I, D, B. That's I, D, B, comma, what, comma, what? That would be a Yeah. Right, so that, that, the B is where the P of A's all live. Yeah. It's got a P of A, because that's one of them. What else? What's, what's the last one? That's always the case with these artists. P of A again. P of A again, yes. And what type are we trying to get at the output of this thing? Oh, we didn't say, but, but Betty's going to do it, I guess. I'll write the left hand side. So we have something that's going to depend on P. 
and something that's going to tend to move on. They tend to be on A. Now the last part of this is really subtle, and I'm still not sure I fully understand why it works. But we're going to connect these two. Yeah, technically you put X and T, so you may. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's very minor, but yeah. It's not my bad. Thank you. Inconsistent notation. It's never happened to the pros. <laughs> oh, sorry. So R of A comma, and then your P. I don't think that's the notation you have. The delays need to something. And what's the relationship between these two terms, everyone? Are they? Okay, so these things are equal, but they're not just equal in this sense. These are actually equal by definition. And that's the part that's a little bit confusing to me. <laughs> so maybe James can explain that a little bit better as to why we. Well, every, every computation rule has this feel, right? At some point, you have to program something, right? You can't just say, here's the declaration of the type, and here's the declaration of all the methods. That's, that's just going to be some uncomputable thing. That's an interface in, in programming languages, right? There's no do anything step. So at some point, you have to say, what's the computation actually going to do? And it's going to say, take the data that came in, do the following things to it, and make that the data that comes out. And this is the statement. And it's the simplest program you can imagine. But it's saying, create a new instance of an identity type called R of P of A, and make that the return. So maybe if I was to do dabble in some pseudocode. So the steps we have, can I use this part, honey? Yeah, feel good. By the way, May and I rehearsed that I would help. So this is not me intruding and trying to like rudely tell him to sit down or anything. So, so I apologize if you felt I was doing that. So if we're creating this, we create a garbage. And then there isn't really in this program, in the syntax of this programming language, I'm, I'm doing a pseudo Java Scala type syntax here for those of you who are wondering. There isn't a good notation for dependent types. So I'm just going to put them in parentheses here. But they're not actually values of an instance here. They're part of the type itself. So this is all going to be inside of some larger brackets just so that I have some notation. Okay, so. In other programming languages that are like Haskell based, there's better languages that can write this kind of stuff. So, okay, and then that's my identity type, and there's one constructor. Which is reflexive law of A. Okay. Now that alone is not a program, I've just told you like the names of some functions. So now I gotta tell you what I'm gonna do. And so inside, maybe I'll just oh, I'll have a, my A, and here's reflexive law. I'm creating my constructor. Reflexive, it takes an A. And constructors, unlike functions, don't return anything. So there's no return type. So this is just simply going to say my A is A. Okay, that's what introduction laws do. So we've gotten through here. And this one here only has type A, A. Right, it only uses the same one here. So the type itself is A and A. Uh, maybe, maybe just because I realized I did this in a sloppy way, I should do what I said earlier so it's a little more consistent. I create a case of this type called reflexive, which takes in A, A, and it extends my identity to be A and then A, A. Okay, that's my sloppy notation. Okay, and that's the only way to build such an example. And now over here, this is an elimination rule that's going to play the role of being used, right? How to use instances of this data. And so I'll just call it def apply. Okay, so I'm going to be given some proof. That's the way we think of these things. We talk about it as the proof of something. which in principle could be any A's and B's. And it's also given some function, P from A to B. And then this one's got to put something out. This is outputting something. 
So the output type is going to be my identity type, uh, B in this case, and then it depends on the parameters P of A and P of B. I realize now that the letter B is being used in a suspicious way here. How about I make this A1, A2? So we all make mistakes. And that's the only one I've ever made, so I think it's okay. This is still not a program because I haven't told you how to do anything. So now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just return some value. What am I going to return? Well, if I was being, you know, really, I don't need to write word new in this, in this syntax, but I'm going to anyway to say a new reflexive thing. Oh, let's do that. That's it. Now that's a complete program for this identity type. And you can actually do this in various programming languages, including things like Scala, but some syntax is a lot uglier in that language for this particular goal. And that's all a type should do, right? Is it should give you a little data type, a little thing you can program as a piece of data. Okay? Now, how does this achieve the Leibniz law, right? That every function, when given equal inputs, must give equal outputs. That seems like a horribly hard thing to do. The demand of program is going to predict every function that could ever be given, and if it was given equal inputs, it would guarantee that it was going to give you equal outputs. And we, I mean, like, we know this is false, right? You can make tons of programs that don't do this. Let's do a little sample program that you would sort of build yourself that shows the danger of what you're doing. So I could create a class called the Rationals, and it needs an A that's uh, an integer, and it needs a B that's a positive integer. Okay? You can design lots of little programs like this. Okay? So it's just going to store these two pieces of data. Uh, yes? I have a perfect view of your laptop. I think it would be really better today. Is that better? Yeah. Does that capture something over here? Uh, if not, yeah. maybe somebody move it. And since, well, maybe I'll move it since I'm able to move to use that board. Okay, so now that we have the whole board, I'll do that. So here's a hurt yourself moment in real life. I have written this program and versions of it many, many times and just felt flustered by no other option. I create something that is going to have some richer structure than just being zero on the successor. Now, the rational numbers are not that much richer, but they're richer because what does it mean to be equal is some goofy algorithm, right? So I, I can program that. So the convention here, well, maybe I won't tell you. I'll just write it slightly more verbosely. So this is going to output a Boolean. Okay? It's going to take an irrational this and irrational that and tell me if they're equal. And I, I kind of know what to do, right? I take this, the numerator, times that, denominator, and I test if that's equal to uh, that denominator times this, I'm sorry, I'm going to say the same thing, don't I? This denominator times that numerator. Okay? That's cross-multiply, right? I get some true or false back out of this. But this is the thing that worries me, and that I know I've done. Did I just type it wrong? I misunderstood it or something. But even if I did it correctly, even if I debugged it, what stops a program like this? So what is this that I've just created? It's a function that takes an irrational thing and spits out an integer. It's a function. It's clear. I mean, you can make this compile, but is it actually a function? 
So let's see what it's actually doing. What's it doing to an A over B? If I was thinking of these as actually rational numbers, this is saying return A plus B. And is that a function? No, because certainly f of 1 half gives me back 3. And f of 2 fourths gives me back 2 plus 4, which is 6. And there's just no system that calls 3 equal to 6. And yet, if I ask my system, are these equal, it'll say what? True. It's incredibly hard to get this right. And yet, we're claiming with these identity types that we're getting it right. That for any function ever given in the universe, this identity function, identity type, is going to force things to be equal. I mean, I just showed you how easy it is to make something where they're not equal. So this is the subtlety that we need to unpack, I believe. Does anybody see what the subtlety is? What would this Martin Law identity type actually be for my thing rat? See, the mistake, I believe, is right here. More to the point, it's right here. See, we're thinking of equality as a test that it passes or doesn't pass. We're not thinking of it as a proposition that we prove. See, if you really can prove that two things are equal and store that proof, then that proof gives the program the way to make it work. So in this 1 half 2 fourths, if I prove these are equal, not by giving true, but by creating a Martin Law identity type of these things, then when I move along to this rat, I would not be allowed to use the 1 and the 2 separately because they're not separable parts. What I'm doing is I'm projecting from this type to these two little components. I am not actually doing a function on rat at all. Rat is just wrapping paper for a z and a z plus. And the equality on the z and the z plus, really, it, this is a function on that. If I replace this with a function like this, that's clearly a function. It's just because I wrapped it with rat that I thought I had made a type with that identity. And what Martin Loth is teaching us is that, no, when you just add the word equals here, you have not made anything equal. You just haven't. So what do you have to do to make things equal? You have to insert your type having just this type of equality. The only way two things are equal is if they were actually the same given data. So Martin Loth would not call these two equal if they're actually separate pieces of data, a 1, 2, and a 2, 4. Now, if you create a unique object called 1 half, and it's introducible by that same thing, then they're equal. So the point is, in Martin Law's type language, you would have to first reduce this before you could compare. You would be asking for the identity type of rat of 1 half with 2 fourths, and that would turn out to be the exact same type as the reduced one, by definition. Any and all programs have to be run before they're passed to the maker of this type. If this is passed into here and you pass in a formula, you first evaluate the formula to bottom, meaning it goes all the way till it reaches a canonical label, and then it does that for the second component. Now, in the case of these, the one half two fourths would all the way run down to both of them being one half. At that point, it could populate this with proof, the reflexive law of one half. And what that would mean is that when you're running this data type through here, it would have already reduced it to one half, and it wouldn't have called it on two fourths at all. It would have had to evaluate this to one half in order to make the claim about what the value is on an output, because you don't even evaluate the function on unevaluated inputs. That's the mistake we made by thinking of this as a rational, but treating it as actually z and z plus. We didn't reduce it to its canonical label. So that's the Martin Law trick. Everything gets reduced before you compare. And then once everything gets reduced, well, then they're the same because they are the same by definition. Okay? That's the trickery that's going on here. 
Now this turns out to be a terrible idea if you want to program because some things don't have natural canonical forms or some things are very expensive to make canonical. Take for example just a simple matrix. I can say two matrices are the same if you could row reduce them to each other. Okay, but it's expensive to row reduce. It's like cubic work. So now I want to compare two matrices and maybe I have a function that takes a matrix in and does something to it and I want it to be a provable function but I don't want to always have to first compute something out of it. Take a harder question, one that's like hard to really solve. How are you going to do that? Pre-compute some things that are very difficult? You're not going to do that. So this is a great solution to like put in the books as like there is a way to make equality work, completely computational, but then reality sits in, which is we don't want to pay the cost of canonization. So we need a better trick. I, so, uh, I have a question. Go for it. So I'm guessing that this would break it, but let's say that um, you just said, okay, I'm going to let this matrix be a canonical thing. And then since I don't want to have to actually figure out how to reduce it to, let's say, Smith form or whatever, I'm going to also let the Smith form be a canonical thing. Does that cause problems? Well, that's actually, that's one which will be type theory. Okay. So it does cause problems, but where does it cause the problem is the point. So, I mean, I think you hit it well. So let's, let's say the degree of graphs. Or whatever, I don't know, the, you know, the max vertex degree of a graph, that's a function on graphs. Are you really going to rewrite all graphs as a canonical up to isomorphism thing? No way. That's a really hard problem. But yet you know this degree function is going to be stable even if you didn't put isomorphic versions in, or a canonical version in. You don't need a canonical graph to work out that degree is stable on that, on isomorphism types. So that's the kind of thing we want to fix. And the solution is, let's see if we fix this part and then quit for the day. The solution comes right here, exactly what many predicted. Why only allow reflexive as the only way you know about equality? So other reasons give you equality that's my facts, and that'll be an identity of whatever type it needs to be, okay? Now if you add that, you don't need to change anything here, because this is still the statement of equal inputs should give you equal output, so that stays the same, but now you have an incomplete computation rule, because this computation rule only worked in the case of the introduction of just a single A. You will have to add your own computation rule, and that computation rule now has to be clever enough to predict any function that it will evaluate to the same place. So it's no longer so obvious how to do that. So the process is known as path listing, and it's a homotopy theory type it's a, the, the methodology, the thought process is to use homotopy and express it as composing paths that go around. And it turns out that there are actual interesting shapes to that. Like there are some equalities that don't contract. They don't just become equivalent to what you could have done with reflexive law. They really go around a hole. So there's a different kind of equality than you might have thought. And you can even hire cells as well. So you can have a whole like tower of difficult versions of equality that we've all been using transactionally on things like the degree of a graph or whatever, where we're, we're not going to reduce it to something canonical. It's just not, it may not even exist. It might not be a decidable program. And yet we did equality on it. What were we doing? The subtlety is, is really next term, I think. So that's our goal. <laughs> but I mean, you can see the problem, right? It's easy to say how to help program the program if you only are allowed to say equal because you're the same thing. As soon as you're equal for some confounding reasons, how do you make every function behave properly? Not, not the, the degree you might figure out on your own, but how do you make every function behave properly? That's, that's a lot harder sound. So, and that's like the miracle of homotopy type theory, if you believe that that's a miracle. I, I, think, it's, I think that's not trivial. Okay. So thank you, Mehdi. Did you have any more you wanted to make sure you said? Oh, no, that was, that was, a, that was a nice thing. I think we could call it a night. We're near the time here. Everybody have a great Thanksgiving, and then um, thank you for coming.